60 seconds and counting. We are go for Apollo 7 at this time. Everybody, our uh, next speaker is a, a gentleman who has so much material that he'll uh, be actually doing another talk tomorrow as well. <laughs> and uh, he has a Bachelor's of Arts in Biblical Studies and Philosophy, a Master's of Arts in Historical and Theological Studies. He has a doctorate in Patristics from the University of Oxford. He is also the author of many, many fascinating books, so many that I've uh, lost track at this point. His uh, <laughs> focus in the field of uh, alternative research, of course, history, uh, archaeology, science, and a lot of other strange stuff as well. He's uh, definitely done some groundbreaking work in uh, these kinds of fields that we cover in this conference and fueled a lot of uh, creative flow, I think, for a lot of people who've, uh, other researchers who picked up a lot on his work as well, uh, sparking debates and, and all kinds of issues on that. So he's been looking at the post-World War II system of hidden finance. And uh, after, you know, basically countries were destroyed and looted, putting the focus on the American intelligence community and the international banksters as well. What is ironic, of course, is the success of the technological achievements of this hidden program and UFO technology was based in large part on the utilization of Axis funds, talents, and technology. His website is gisadeathstar.com. His first talk today, then, is going to be on Bullion Brains Bonds, Financial, Historical, and Cultural Analysis of the Breakaway Civilization and its Analytical and Policy Formation Culture. There seems to be hardly any subject that this man haven't or can't address, and his scope is like few others. Please give a round of applause for Joseph P. Farrell. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Good, all right. So how are we gonna pay for all this stuff? Um, what I'm gonna do is take you through kind of a review of a very complex, difficult case that I've been outlining in several books and try to make clear my process of reasoning for saying the things I do. The books that, uh, if you're not familiar with them, The SS Brotherhood of the Bells, Secrets of the Unified Field, The Nazi International, Saucers, Swastikas, and Psyops, Covert Wars and Breakaway Civilizations, Covert Wars and the Clash of Civilizations, and also an important book called Babylon's Banksters. I might have added another book called The Financial Vipers of Venice. Now what I'm going to do in this talk, I have another one tomorrow. I'm primarily concentrated on the strategic and financial aspects of this system of finance and what the international, pardon me, the intelligence community was confronted with with the UFO problem in the post-war world. There's four points to my talk, the two and threefold post-war strategic problem. We have three problems essentially that we're going to be talking about today. Communism, UFOs, and Nazis, not necessarily in that order. The second problem is the mechanisms of secret finance. In other words, how are we going to pay for all the extraordinary technology that Mark and Mike outlined for you this morning, and, and a great job on, on both of them. What we're really going to be looking at is all of the Axis plunder. We tend to think of only the paperclip scientists as being a part of this project. But this is not true. We have to look also at what was done with all of that Axis loot that was captured by the Nazis and the Imperial Japanese as well during World War II. And we're going to be talking about some financial fraud on a very, very high order. And I'm assuming also that Secretary Fitz is going to be addressing some of these things in her talk tomorrow. And the final uh, point there, point number three, I'm going to be talking about the bearer bond scandals that emerged in the last decade. I think this is an important and overlooked part of the story because as far as I'm concerned, we're looking at indications of a hidden system of finance that runs in the trillions of dollars. And this would be the funding mechanism in part 
for some of the technologies that you saw this morning. And then finally, I'm going to sum it up with some general indications. I'm going to try and get through this and catch us up on time, so I'm going to go at breakneck speed, so <laughs> bear with me. All right. Now, my thesis here, I'm going to be reading a lot to you because the devil is in the details. My thesis here is very simple. The post-World War II national security establishment was faced with a threefold strategic problem. The first was the post-war Axis elites. They didn't just die and go away quietly into the night. And there are indications of an ongoing independent research project threatening the national security of the United States, and we'll get into that in this talk. The second is the communist Soviet bloc, obviously. And then finally, and in my opinion the most important, is the UFO and demonstrations that occurred over sensitive airspace and defense installations. I'll be talking much more about that tomorrow. That's a huge part of the problem that we have to look at in terms of a secret space program or breakaway civilization. Now, each of these factors contributed to the formation of a national security finance intelligence military industrial complex. And additionally, the national security establishment would have concluded that some UFO activity, and I'll review it tomorrow, constituted a threat, perhaps not an imminent one, but a threat nonetheless. And this is the key point. This will require the institution of a long-term Mega Manhattan project. And of course, once we've said that, we need the financing. Now, the perception on the part of the national security apparatus that some UFO activity could be construed as potentially threatening and therefore potentially hostile required them in their thinking, and what we're trying to re do here, folks, is reverse engineer the policy formation culture of the national security establishment in the United States. So this would have been viewed, in my opinion, as something that they would have viewed as potentially hostile. And this requires the establishment of this long-term Mega Manhattan Project in order to investigate and, if possible, develop the technologies to emulate the performance of the UFO. And this you saw in particular in, in Mark's excellent presentation this morning. Now, this required, in its turn, the establishment of an immense and entirely hidden system of finance. And I want to stress this point because if you are wondering why the financial world now makes no sense, I think this talk may give you some clues as to what may be going on behind the scenes. Now, this system of finance has to be entirely hidden. In other words, what I'm talking about now in this talk is not the black budget. I'm talking about something even deeper and even more off the books, all right? Now, this finance system, this hidden system of finance was laid in the years immediately following World War II, and we'll get into the details in this talk. It's based to some degree, though not entirely, on the striking of a modus vivendi with the former Axis elites in order to utilize their funds and their talent and their technologies. So what we have, I'm suggesting to you, and what we will see as I outline in this talk, is the institution of financial fraud on an industrial scale that persists over several decades. Now let's look first of all at the first strategic threat very briefly, the communists. And there's four points that if you go back to the time period from 1945, the end of the war, on up to, say, the early 1960s. There are four factors 
that I think weigh very heavily in the culture policy formation culture of, of the hidden intelligence and national security state. The first, obviously, is the memory of Pearl Harbor and the threat of surprise attack because we quite literally lost most of our fleet in Pearl Harbor. And the second factor coupled with this is the advent of new technologies and weapons of mass destruction, the atom bomb in 1945 and then again the hydrogen bomb in 1952. And then the third thing that we need to consider here is you couple this technology with the German V2 development, the development of ballistic missiles which was underway, we knew this, in the Soviet Union, and we certainly were doing it as well. This meant that the threat of surprise attack was very real. It was a very real thing that they had to consider. And then the fourth factor, of course, in 1957, was the Russians launching Sputnik. Because, of course, theoretically, the potential was if you can orbit a satellite, then you might be able to orbit nuclear weapons and literally rain destruction down at a moment's notice. Now, all of this leads to this gentleman here and the development of what was called the Open Skies Policy. And the thinking was, this was a policy that we will see was developed and advocated by Nelson Rockefeller, who was a prominent advisor to President Eisenhower. They immediately concluded that we should have a policy whereby both sides could fly over each other's countries, monitor their activities, and make sure that neither side was subjected to a surprise attack. And this led to the development, of course, of the spy satellite. And all of this is coordinated by this man here, Richard Bissell, Richard M. Bissell, a very important man. If you don't know this man, get acquainted with him because this man is in charge of all the covert operations of the CIA throughout the 50s, up to and including the U-2 flights and, of course, the Bay of Pigs. This is the gentleman that is, so to speak, the top of the brain trust coordinating all these activities. But this gentleman is also a close associate with Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller, who, as I said before, formulates the policy and Bissell is the one who ultimately is behind the development of the spy satellite. Now, I want you to consider, if you're dealing with communists, UFOs, and possibly some independent group developing exotic technologies, you have to know where it's coming from and what they're up to. So you have to develop a crash program to create the technologies to monitor all of these types of developments. And it falls to Richard Bissell. Now I want to read you this quotation from my book Covert Wars and Clash of Civilizations and I'm citing an excellent book on the development of spy satellite technology by Parker Temple and that book is entitled Shades of Grey, National Security and the Evolution of Space Reconnaissance. And this is what I said in Covert Wars and Clash of Civilizations. By November 1954, President Eisenhower had made the spy satellite program official, and CIA Director Alan Dulles informed Bissell that he was to manage it. So stop and consider now. You have the man in charge of covert operations like the U-2 flights, in charge of covert operations like the Bay of Pigs, and now he's also in charge of technological development. So bear this in mind. There is a close association between the development of these secret space technologies and covert operations. The problem lay in financing such a crash program and keeping it entirely secret. And Bissell and Dulles decided that the money would come from the Contingency Reserve Fund the usual funding source, here it comes, for covert activities, and Bissell drafted a memorandum to that effect for Eisenhower's approval. It was the use of streamlined procurement procedures, and here comes a key phrase, unvouchered funds 
that had contributed to its success. Now let's go to one more interesting quotation, again from my book, Covert Wars and Clash of Civilizations. Now listen to this. As the Corona satellite was being developed, it quickly became clear that there was need for a backup camera system. This was developed by iTech, whose founders put up only a modest amount of money, while Lawrence S. Rockefeller and other Rockefeller family members furbished, pardon me, furnished most of the funds required for the first few months of operations, unquote. So what do we have? Well, first of all, notice that you have now a direct corporate and finance and intelligence community interface at the very top or the very pinnacle of the American banking system. Secondly, you have the use of unvouchered funds, whatever those are, which implies the possibility as yet, we haven't really argued that case fully yet, but it implies the possibility that we're now dealing with a hidden system of finance. And the third thing that we notice is that covert operations and covert black projects are being coordinated not only at an extremely high level, but by the same man. Now, let's go to the second component, the Nazis. This is such a crucial part of the story, I cannot emphasize it strongly enough. This gentleman here is General Mayor, General Major Reinhard Galen. He was the head during World War II of an organization that was called Fremte Heere Ost, which means Foreign Armies East. In other words, this German general was in charge of all of the military intelligence of Germany's Wehrmacht on the Eastern Front throughout all of World War II. And by Eastern Front, in intelligence terms, meant not only inside of the Soviet Union, but deeply inside the Soviet Union, and also Western Europe, or pardon me, Eastern Europe. Now this gentleman, as the war was winding down, approached the American general Siebert and through Siebert was negotiating with Alan Dulles who was the station chief of the OSS in Zurich, Switzerland. And what the negotiation was basically attempting to do was he was trying to maintain his military intelligence network and system entirely intact after the war with him running it. Now listen to this, these are the terms of the agreement that were worked out with the leaders of American intelligence during World War II and put into place after World War II. And here I am quoting directly from General Galen's memoirs, okay? Number one, a clandestine German intelligence organization was to be set up using existing potential. In other words, we're keeping the Nazi intelligence network in place to continue information gathering in the East just as we had been doing before. The basis for this was our common interest in a defense against communism. Number two, the German organization was to work for or under the Americans, but jointly with the Americans. Number three. The organization would operate exclusively under German re leadership. In other words, what he's telling you there is that part of the negotiation left him in place and in control of this intelligence network after World War II. And eventually this intelligence service is rolled into the West German Bundesnachrichtendienst to become its intelligence service, which remains their version of the Central Intelligence Agency to this day. So in other words, there is a direct connection between this war wartime Nazi intelligence organization then 
and German intelligence now. This was the man that founded it. Would operate exclusively under German leadership, which re would receive its directives and assignments from the Americans until a new government was established in Germany. Number four. The organization was to be financed by the Americans with funds which were not to be part of the occupation costs and in return the organization would supply all of its intelligence reports to the Americans. Number six. This is, this is the one I love. Listen carefully. This, this, will, this will, I think, I hope, show you exactly what's going on. Should the organization at any time find itself in a position where American and German interests diverged, it was accepted that the organization would consider the interests of Germany first." Unquote. What a deal, huh? Now, there's an American historian by the name of Carl Oglesby that was familiar, he was a professor of history, that was familiar with all of these developments. And he wrote about this agreement with Galen's organization, and please understand, Galen commanded a massive organization which included expiley, pardon me, exiley or expelly fronts of people from white Russia, from the Ukraine, many of them headquartered in this country, incidentally, think Dallas, Texas in the 1960s. This meant, according to Oglesby, that this agreement, quote, substantially preempted the CIA's civilian character before it was ever born. Thus, whatever the CIA was from the standpoint of law, it remained, from the standpoint of practical intelligence collection, a front for a house of Nazi spies, unquote. And this is true, because if you look at this next quotation at the bottom, there's a book out called Christ, uh, by Christopher Simpson called Blowback. Subtitle is The First Full Account of America's Recruitment of Nazis and Its Disastrous Effect on Our Domestic Foreign and Foreign Policy. So bad was and so total was the early influence of the Galen Organization. That's what it was called, the Galen Org. Over the collection and even analysis of intelligence inside of the Eastern and Soviet bloc that, quote, during the first years of the CIA under Rear Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter's administration, Galen's reports and analyses were sometimes simply retyped onto CIA stationery and presented to President Truman without further comment, unquote. Now there's another problem with this post-war Nazi nexus. There's another problem. And the problem are the indicators that somewhere in the world the Nazis continued to develop the very technologies that they were working on inside the Third Reich during World War II. So this brings us to the next point on the talk. In the coming slides, I'm going to outline the Ronald Richter problem, as I like to call it. This is Dr. Richter over here. And this is related to the 1951 Peron press conference, which we have to talk about, because in 1951, Juan Peron called a press conference introduced Dr. Richter and said that Argentina made the grand announcement that Argentina had solved the problem of the hydrogen bomb. And we hadn't even exploded ours yet. That was a little over eight or nine months later in 1952. So in other words, Argentina is trying to steal our thermonuclear thunder, so to speak. And Dr. Richter was introduced by Peron at this press conference. 
And the reason I'm putting up our hydrogen bomb test, the mic test, this is going to be one of the problems that we're going to be looking at not only today but tomorrow. So I want to kind of clue you in there about that. We're going to talk about the U.S. Air Force's secret inquiries and assessments of Richter because this man is talking in 1951 about the kinds of physics that Mark McCandlish showed you this morning. Okay? And we're going to get to him in just a few moments. Those statements that he made to the United States Air Force after being publicly denounced in the world press as being a fraud and a mountebank and a swindler and a con artist, after that happens and after the Mike hydrogen bomb test in 1952, we sent, the U.S. Air Force sent secretly people to interview Dr. Richter and exactly what he was doing, find out exactly what he was doing. Now when you read these statements, as we're going to see in a few seconds, what Richter is talking about is cold fusion. Okay? So let's go to the U.S. Air Force and what they said in their report about their interviews with Dr. Richter. Listen carefully. The program outlined by Dr. Richter is theoretically possible. The questions to be solved concerning the materials and methods needed to achieve the results possible by his scheme far exceed the capability of present limitations. Furthermore, changing gears here, Dr. Richter, although having developed a reputation for being a competent scientist in Europe, has in the last five years exhibited all the characteristics of a first-class mountebank and swindler. When financial exigencies dispelled the conspiratorial air around his program, the whole scheme burst with all the force of an exploding soap bubble. Consequently, it is not reasonable to place very much reliance upon statements by Dr. Richter. It is requested, changing gears again, it is requested, however, that all material of this nature available continue to be collected for evaluations. Now stop and consider this. It's theoretically possible. It far exceeds our current technologies. Then he's a fraud and a mountebank and a swindler and a con artist. But nonetheless, we're going to keep gathering every scrap of material on this guy that we can. All right. So what's the what's the real problem? Listen to what Dr. Richter himself told the Air Force. This is actually from his declassified files from the National Archives. And I reproduced this in the book Nazi International if you're wondering which book it's in. This is Richter explaining his fraudulent mountebank theory to the U.S. Air Force, which said it's, he's a fraud and a mountebank, but yet he's talking about things theoretically possible. And in one scientist's investigation in the file, he said that Dr. Richter is some sort of mad genius working in the 1970s. So one American scientist is saying, oh yeah, this guy is absolutely correct. He's just working way so far ahead of us that this is why he appears to be a fraud and a mountebank. Now listen to what Richter says. We assume that highly compressed electron gas, that's a plasma, folks, becomes a detector for energy exchange with what we call Mark McCandlish, you're going to love this, zero point energy. On the basis of exchange coupling, it seems possible to extract a compression proportional amount of zero point energy by means of a magnetic field 
controlled exchange fluctuation between the compressed electron gas and a sort of cell structure in space representing what we call a zero point energy. So in other words, Richter is talking about a relationship between fusion, what goes on in the sun, and a lattice structure in space. Now over five decades later, and by the way, he was claiming to do all of this, he was claiming to get fusion reactions and a coupling to the zero point energy at far lower temperatures than the sun or hydrogen bombs. So in other words, this is what caused him to be denounced as a fraud in a mountebank. He was talking three decades ahead of Pons and Fleischmann about cold fusion and he's explaining it in terms of an interaction between plasmas under compression within magnetic stress. What, think of the sun again, folks. And what does the sun cause besides a lot of heat and electromagnetic energy? It's the gravity well that holds the solar system together. So in other words, Richter's also telling you, he's also implying, find a technology to duplicate this by means of plasma compression and electromagnetic stress, and this will couple to the zero point energy and it will allow you to have anti-gravity. Okay? Now over three decades later, the idea of a lattice interaction with the zero point energy is now the theory that scientists are beginning to look at seriously as the theory that explains cold fusion. And it's called lattice assisted nuclear reaction. Lattices, cell structure, same thing. Now, we're racing through here, folks. The third problem that the national security establishment has to look at, besides all of these Nazis down there in Argentina doing very strange things for Juan Perón, and besides the communist bloc, is we have a UFO problem, okay? And I'm going to try and highlight what I think are three, not the only, but at least three of the major contributory factors that if we're going to reverse engineer the policy formation culture of the national security establishment that we have to look at. The first is obviously 1947. There's a huge UFO flap in the year 1947. Uh, I believe Richard Dolan at one point uh, when we talked recently said that there were something like hundreds of them all over the world. The second in thing that we're going to be talking about is a German-American engineer by the name of Alfred Leding and the very first assessments that were done within the national security establishment. Remember, 1947 is also the year that President Truman signs the National Security Act creating the CIA and the NSA into law. And as we're going to see a little later on, 1947 is a crucial year financially. All right? Lading offered the first assessments and interestingly enough we're going to see that the first thing that he suspects is somehow the Nazis are involved with this. But later on Alfred Lading also offers, for very deliberate, very specific, very clear reasons, another hypothesis, not in opposition to the first one, but rather as a supplement to it. And that is, he thinks that some of it may be coming from off-world simply because we don't have the production capacity to produce all of these UFOs seen all over the world oftentimes in the same time frame. So let's look very briefly at 1947 
And one of the reasons of why, possibly, Lading was first thinking in terms of Nazis. And that's this gentleman here, Kenneth Arnold. And those of you familiar with the UFO literature probably know this name by heart. Those of you who aren't, Kenneth Arnold was flying in June of 1947 near Mount Rainier in Washington. And he described seeing, I think it was seven or nine, something like that, what he called saucers skipping. And he later landed and drew a picture of it. Please note this, it's going to be very important in a moment. And these reports that Arnold and others saw in 1947, incidentally, were reported to the FBI by the local special agent in Boise, Idaho, I think it was, a fellow by the name of Guy Bannister. And the subject of these UFO reports that Bannister filed was always called subject matter X. That is the beginning of your X files. For those of you who don't know who Guy Bannister is, Guy Bannister, if you've seen Oliver Stone's movie JFK, he's the New Orleans detective played by Ed Asner. And he was one of the people that New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison suspected of having been involved in the Kennedy assassination. So take that for whatever it's worth, but I'm laying it out there to show you how deep and how wide and far flung all of these threads and interconnections really are. Now let's look at something. When Arnold drew his sketch of what he saw. Imagine someone like Alfred Lading, who we'll get to in a minute, sitting there at Wright-Patterson Air Base in Dayton, Ohio, a member of the Air Technical Intelligence Command. His boss is General Nathan Twining. And Lading is in contact with all of the German paperclip scientists, including Walter Lippisch, who had been brought to Wright-Patterson Air Base. And he therefore is very familiar with the Horton Flying Wing. So Lading writes one of his first intelligence in assessments. And here's, here's Alfred Lading. Notice what he's working on here? And guess where he's working on that? Lockheed, okay? Lading has all of these contacts with the German paperclip scientists at Wright-Patterson, and he knows about the Horton Flying Wing and some of these other exotic aerodromes. Now, please don't misunderstand me here. I am not one of those that believes that the Hanabu and the Vril, and all of these things that you hear that the Nazis actually built, these flying field propulsion solsters, are true. I do not believe that. But they did have some very advanced aerodynamics projects. And one of them, of course, was the Horton Flying Wing. And on that basis, it's Lading, in my estimation, who's probably the brains behind the 1947 Air Force collection memorandum, well known to many people in the subject of secret technologies and ufology and so on, where you read it very carefully. And one of the things that General Shulgin is wanting the Air Force to do is find out where are the Horton brothers? I'll tell you where. Guess where? Argentina. Now the fact, as I state up here on the slide, the fact that the US Air Force is inquiring about the Horton brothers' whereabouts indicates, number one, that it suspects that there's some sort of connection 
between Nazi technology and the UFO problem. And secondly, that it was perhaps fearful of the post-war continuation of some of those projects, either by other host countries, the Soviet Union, Argentina, Brazil, or by independent Nazi groups, which is, in fact, my suspicion as to what is really going on. So, in addition to this, and I'm reading now from Covert Wars and Clash of Civilizations. In addition to this, on November 10, 1947, a secret intelligence collection memorandum was issued by the 970th Counterintelligence Corps to senior officers in Europe and specifically to the Nuremberg, Würzburg, Bayreuth, and Bamberg subregions. The document it concludes that the UFOs are real, that they represent a technology, and that it was further suspected that the flying objects may have been developed from original plans and experiments conducted by the Germans prior to the capitulation. Given his hand in the Shulgin Memorandum, which, was first, which first voiced those suspicions, it is easy to determine that Lading was, if nothing else, extremely suspicious of potential German origins for some of the UFO phenomenon. However, his contact with the Nazi scientists at Wright-Patterson, in my opinion, plus his own experiments, in such aerodynes, like flying saucers, convinced him, I think, of something else. Namely, that these technologies were very costly and difficult to produce. Just think of the engineering difficulty that you saw detailed by some of the planes that Michael Schratt talked about before lunch, not to mention the engineering difficulty and cost of what Mark McCandlish talked about. 24 feet wide quartz? That's enormously expensive. In addition to this, in my opinion, the sheer numbers of UFO reports, the sheer scale of what's going on, and this is very true, I don't even have to say in my opinion, because this is what Leiding thought. This convinced him that no contemporary production infrastructure existed on planet Earth to produce and account for all of these UFO reports. So he comes to entertain the extraterrestrial possibility as early as 1948. And there's a school of thought out there that thinks that Lading was actually responsible for a well-known document in ufology called the White Hot Intelligence Estimate, where this idea is first broached for the first time in Air Force intelligence literature. And in my opinion, I think that document is probably true, and I think it comes from this man right here, Alfred Lading. So in other words, the national security establishment had come to hold two things at the same time, not in opposition to each other, but as complements of each other. First, there's some secret human source, possibly independent Nazis, possibly some other group that is behind some UFO reports. And secondly, it had also come to hold that no terrestrial explanation by itself could account for all of them simply because of the enormous cost and production difficulty. Now I keep saying enormous cost because obviously we're leading up to the financial problem here. 
So what are the implications of this? This means the United States national security military industrial finance complex is confronted by a triple threat, communists, Nazis, UFOs. And that his response has to do four things. First of all, it has to develop technologies that can do triple duty dealing with all three potential threats. Not the least of which is finding out, if possible, where they're coming from and what they're doing. Secondly, since the UFO represented the greatest long-term potential, not imminent, potential threat, a long-term program had to be put into place to emulate its technological performance. And that requires, number three, a decades-long financial commitment. In other words, this is the man oops, whoa. This is the Manhattan Project on steroids. The Manhattan Project lasted three and a half years. It cost billions of dollars, in 1945 dollars, incidentally. This is a problem that's going to require decades and funds in the trillions of dollars for decades. The fourth thing that it requires, therefore, is not only secrecy regarding the technological research aspects of it, but it will require extreme secrecy in the funding mechanism for it. So now we're finally at the third point of the outline, Axis plunder, market manipulation and fraud. Now I'm going to be talking about two essential points, Truman in 1947 as I indicated earlier and this Axis plunder and its relationship to the National Security Act and the hidden system of finance, which are in turn all related to the problem of the UFO and therefore to secret space programs and breakaway civilizations. But I want to draw your attention here for a moment to the second point up here, the formation of the Bilderberg Group and Operation Paperclip. Now the Bilderbergers, as you know, were founded in 1954, that's when they began meeting. On the Western Anglo-American side, you had, of course, Lawrence and David Rockefeller pushing for the formation of this group. You had, of course, the involvement of the Rothschilds in Great Britain, but on the European side, who do you have? Well, you have Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. Now, Prince Bernhard is a minor German nobleman, but here's, here's the curveball. Most people don't know that Prince Bernhard was kind of a middle echelon manager for guess who? Interessen, Gemeinschaft, Farben, Industrie, Aktionsgesellschaft, IG Farben. And one of the chief attendees at those early Bilderberg meetings was one Dr. Hermann Josef Apps, at that time CEO of Deutsche Bank. During the war, Dr. Ops was the head of a small handling bank in Berlin. I can never remember the name of it. But this handling bank that he was the head of was the bank that handled all public accounts of the Reich government. In other words, that's the man signing Adolf Hitler's paycheck as Reichskanzler. Okay? That's the guy. So in other words, it looks to me like what the Bilderberg Group is, is it's the financial aspect of Operation Paperclip. It is, in other words, the coordinating body that's going to move all of this Axis plunder into the Western system of finance, be kept all off the books, 
and some of it diverted into covert operations, some of it diverted into black, black projects, and then some of it funneled back to Europe in the form of American aid. And I like to, I like to kid a lot about this observation. But behind both of these men on the European side, there's a fellow by the name, in my opinion, I think he survived the bunker, by the name of Martin Bormann. And when you're making deals with Martin Bormann, you're dealing with Dick Cheney without the warmth and charm. <laughs> Now let's look at this Axis loot for a moment because everyone thinks about the Nazis going around Europe and plundering art treasures and stockpiling everything. Nobody remembers the Japanese. But in point of fact, throughout World War II, there was a Japanese operation called Operation Golden Lily. It was led by a member of the imperial household by the name of Prince Chichibu. So in other words, this is not even in the hands of the Kempite. It's not even in the hands of Japanese intelligence. This is directly an operation of the Imperial House. And what they did is they went in. You, you think the Nazis set the level for efficiency of plunder. Mm -mm. The Japanese went into Asia and China and Southeast Asia and literally suctioned every last scrap of any kind of precious metal, gold, silver, platinum, you name it, jewels, cash, artworks, ancient manuscripts, everything that they could lay their hands on to bring it back to Japan. This was called Operation Golden Lily. Now, this gentleman here, toward the end of the war, after the American invasion of the Philippine archipelago, learns about it. And his name is Captain, later General, Ed Lansdale. That name might be familiar to some of you JFK assassination researchers. Lansdale learned about Operation Gold Lily and all of this vast loot that was buried on Luzon and Mindanao and all over the Philippine Islands. And when he learned about it, he flew to Tokyo to debrief General MacArthur. And MacArthur said, well, that's interesting. I need you to get on a plane and fly to Washington and brief President Truman. We're talking again, folks, in 1945 dollars terms of billions of dollars. Billions. So Lansdale flies to Washington and briefs Truman. Now please note right at the bottom here, this is the beginning in 1947, not only of a black budget, but please understand me now, something completely separate and totally hidden. Truman, on learning of it, discusses it with his cabinet and, quote, decided to proceed with the recovery, but to keep it a state secret, unquote. Now, folks, at that moment, President Truman put the American intelligence apparatus in the banking business. At that moment. I leave it to you to work out all of the implications of that decision for what's going on right now, both domestically and internationally. Now that bit of information, incidentally, if you don't know this work, it's, it's a wonderful book discussing Operation Golden Lily called Gold Warriors. It's by Sterling and Peggy Seagrave. Now, 
there's another aspect to this story. This is what the Seagraves themselves state in Gold Warriors on page three a little later on. The treasure was combined with Axis loot recovered in Europe to create a worldwide covert political action fund to fight communism. This black gold gave the Truman administration access to virtually limitless unvouchered funds for covert operations. But I believe it goes beyond mere covert operations because as I put it down here at the bottom of the slide, the sheer scale when you combine that Japanese loot and that Nazi loot suggests to me, given the threefold strategic problem that we're facing, that much more than communism or covert operations against it, or even post-war Nazis or whoever else, but that the UFO was a long-term problem requiring that technological emulation. And if you're setting up a system of hidden finance, go back to what I said previously about Richard Bissell and the Rockefellers and the Rockefellers contributing their own personal private family funds to the development of the backup camera system for the early Corona satellites. Oh, we'll donate you the money. You don't have to tap the taxpayer. Go back to that element and what you see now forming with this hidden system of finance is a nexus between this black project's world requiring its hidden system of finance and that's going to demand at some point the participation off the books of the major prime banks of the West. It in turn implies something else. Since you're keeping all of that Japanese gold secret, it means that any amount or estimate of the amounts of gold that you see in the world today are probably badly obfuscated and perhaps off as much as an order of magnitude. And that implies yet something else. Because if you're keeping this as a hidden system of finance, what you see you can do is you can take all that gold and all that silver and all those gems and all those bonds and all that liquid cash, move it into those participating prime banks and keep it all off the books. That's your secret reserve. And you can rehypothecate that reserve over because you see it's secret, over and over and over and over. In other words, what I'm telling you is exactly what Richard Dolan has said in his books. The UFO is not only the principal problem of post-war historiography, it's the principal hidden problem in finance. So let's look and sum it up. Truman's 1947 decision to keep all this access plunder a state secret implies truly profound and significant things for the long-term financial structure of the West. Number one, it implies the intelligence national security complex now entered the realm of international finance and banking directly. Number two, it implies that the intelligence community had to have at a lower level of complicity the participation of prime banks around the world to make such a system work. What I've just told you is that they are participants in a system ultimately involving fraud. Thirdly, 
It implies the further complex interface of the American intelligence national security oligarchy. After all, we're not going to be able to recover all that Axis loot without them telling us where it is. And they're going to drive, trust me, a hard bargain. So it requires the interface not only with their scientists, but with their managers, with their technical people, and as we saw with Galen, with who? With their intelligence people. To the point that we keep that intelligence network intact. The fourth thing it implies is the creation of a vast secret mechanism of finance totally unaccountable to the public and their institutions of government and increasing the dominant financial concern of the American federal government. Fifthly, it implies the creation of a vast secret mechanism of finance capable of the manipulation of markets, for example, the bullion markets. And finally, point six and seven, it rationalizes almost perfectly why there is such widespread numerical discrepancies in the various estimates of the amounts of various types of bullion actually in existence, allowing you to manipulate those markets. And seven, it rationalizes a hidden reason for the formation of the Bilderberg Group between the Rockefeller interests representing the new financial intelligence complex and Prince Bernard, former manager of IG Farben Industry, and the consistent presence of Dr. Hermann Josef Ops, CEO of Deutsche Bank, at an early stage of the Bilderberg meetings which becomes the mechanism for coordinating the movement of European Axis plunder directly and secretly into Western banks. So, let's go to Japan by way of Nazi Germany. Shortly after the war started, this isn't on the slide, shortly after the war started, Reichs, uh, pardon me, Obergruppenführer Reinhard Heydrich, probably the most vile man in all of the Third Reich, bar none, issued a top secret memorandum that the SS was going to begin, and please note my words carefully because I'm citing the English translation of this German document, was going to begin the unauthorized industrial scale production of English pound sterling notes, unquote. So in other words, he's telling you that the Third Reich is going into the counterfeiting business on a major scale. This is not a couple guys with a printing press in their garage and throwing their paper money, their counterfeit paper money, into the washing machine to age it. No, this, this is huge. But the Germans, being Germans, were clever about this. They insisted that their product be absolutely undetectable. In other words, you could not distinguish a German-produced pound sterling note and the real thing. So they tested their product by having a gentleman go to Switzerland, to a Swiss bank, trying to cash and convert some of these counterfeit pound sterling notes to other currency. And of course the British, or pardon me, the Swiss banks knew how to tell what was suspicious or not past the muster. By the end of the war, depending on which estimates you read, by the end of the war, Great Britain had somewhere between 150 million to 300 million, nearly a third of a billion, pounds sterling counterfeit notes in circulation that were so good 
that the Bank of England had to recall that whole series of designs of pound sterling, redesign their currency, and issue new currency. And they had to honor the counterfeit notes. That's how good it was. And the Germans also figured out, hey, a fellow in Germany by the name of Friedrich von Schwendt figured out that you could use this system not only as, as a system of economic warfare against the United Kingdom, but hey, this is a wonderful source for funding our covert ops and our secret research. Isn't that handy? So now let's look at Prime Minister Tanaka in Japan. Of course, you all know that Japan, since the end of World War II, has been basically a satrapy of the United States. Now, Prime Minister Tanaka was faced with Japanese bonds that were coming to maturity, and he didn't have the money in the finance ministry, so what he decided to do is he's going to issue new bonds to the bondholders. I'll swap the paper. And these are very clever bonds. Pay attention to this one. If you don't think governments indulge in fraud on a massive scale in their own securities, this is essential to my argument. At the time, this is the world's second largest economy. So this again is from Covert Wars, Breakaway Civilizations. I'm citing Sterling and Peggy Seagrave, Gold Warriors, pages 127 and 128. I've got to read this to you. Not only were these IOUs, these new bonds, they're called 57 bonds, for astronomical sums of money, but physically, the 57s were unlike, pay attention here folks, unlike anything previously issued by the government of Japan. They were not offered to the public at large. Nor were they to be traded on the international bond market like normal government bonds. So only the holders actually saw them. The magic of this scheme is that by their very difference, it was possible for the finance minister later to declare all 57s were forgeries. Only certain ones were selectively and very secretly renegotiated, here it comes, at a discount. Those who paid for their original government bonds and were then forced to exchange them for 57s were thus swindled twice. So in other words, they're even robbing from the super rich. These bonds were for astronomical sums of money. They were sold on a market that was completely separate and hidden from the normal bond market. So look what that implies. Let's summarize it here. They're issued for astronomical sums of money. They're issued with peculiarities and other flaws, allowing them to be subsequently denounced as forgeries and counterfeits by the very government that issued them. They're, number three, not sold in any public bond market offering, thus implying that they're sold on a completely hidden and secret bond market. Four, the issuance of such bonds implies by the nature of the case the necessary participation of some prime banks in the scheme. And fifthly, the creation of such a scheme, the issuance of such bonds, means that a mechanism is being created here to defraud or harvest the wealth of the very rich and super rich. So, with this in mind, let's look at the bearer bond scandals that dropped right off the radar screens of the major media almost as soon as they were reported. And I want you to look at one of these fake bonds up here. What do you see? Well, first of all, it's for $1 billion. 
It's got a serial number, AP11071035, AP11. It's issued, supposedly, by an East Asia securities trading firm that genuinely exists. This is a red seal designed to kind of imitate the red treasury seal of a United States note called Money World. It's got the picture of the president on the obverse who said, hey, let's go to the moon. It's issued for a, a, in a denomination that officially the United States denies it ever issued any bearer bond in denominations of a billion dollars, much less through money. On the reverse, what do you have? What do you see here? Space. The lunar excursion module. The space shuttle. The moon. Okay? Now, East Asia News, which is a Vatican-associated news service, which, incidentally, remember Hirohito? scouring East Asia for all that loot. Guess what bank he put some of it in? Yeah. East Asia News, which has a Vatican connection, reported on the Italian bearer bond scandal that occurred in Italy in 2009 near Chiasso, where they recovered $134.5 billion of counterfeit bonds the story wouldn't go away, and two weeks later, President Obama, at a news conference, had to state, well, these were all counterfeit. Oh, but incidentally, what he didn't say was that this was exactly the amount of money in the Troubled Asset Relief Fund. <laughs> okay? Now, I'm going to suggest to you something very significant about this bond. Let's assume it is fake, but that money world, which trades in sovereign securities, incidentally, in East Asia, big trading firm, that money world is sending a message. What's the message? Well, I'm going to suggest to you it's this. If you're going to set up a hidden system of finance using fraud and counterfeiting and Axis loot and a bunch of other stuff, one of the things you might do to get the participation of prime banks is to collateralize whatever is found out in space. Kind of nifty, huh? It's kind of like Venice. Kind of like Venice. We want to send some ships to the east and get some spices, trade some things. We need a loan. And the banks on the Rialto say, sure, give us a certain share of the profits of whatever it is you bring back. Could this be why they're talking about asteroid mining all of a sudden? In Spain and Italy, the bearer bonds look different. Note the fake serial number, G, 1111111 and G. Based on the $100,000 bill, gold certificate, the Wilson bill, that's only used between Federal Reserve Banks, denominated in $1 billion. These are what they looked like in the Spanish recovery with their little coupons down here. In Spain, in 2009, 1.65 trillion dollars worth of these bearer, or pardon me, these gold-backed bearer bonds denominated in one billion dollars each were seized by Spanish financial police in Spain. And in Italy, that amount was six trillion. Who has that kind of pocket change? These were, incidentally, printed with the name Federal Reserved 
bombs. Prime Minister Tanaka, huh? What a guy. But consider the implications. Federal Reserve? Well, it's a private company. Can private companies issue bonds? Sure. It's not coming from the U.S. Treasury. It's not us. There's your, there's your plausible deniability. In both cases, on the left, these fake bonds were found in strong boxes. Over here, the strong boxes of the Federal Reserve Branch Bank of Dallas. This was the one recovered in Spain. Over here in Italy, the Federal Reserve strong box of the Chicago Federal Reserve. In Spain, accompanying the bonds were bundles $10 million bundles of $100,000 gold certificate, the Wilson Gold Certificates, banded in a metal band with the swastika, lo hmm, the swastika logo of J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Now what might all this indicate, and this will be the um, penultimate slide for this talk, all bonds were first, of course, denounced as counterfeits. Secondly, have you ever counterfeited a $7 bill? Counterfeiters don't go to all the expense to counterfeit things that don't exist. Why would counterfeiters produce something that don't exist and then counterfeit the strong boxes? and then run the same scam over and over again in spite of the lack of success in redeeming any of these bonds even at extremely sharp discount. Still a lot of money. And do it counterfeiting things denominated in such astronomical amounts of money as I said here at such steep discounts you probably couldn't get many people. Why would you go to all the effort to, to run a counterfeiting scheme like that? Well, my conclusion is, even if they are counterfeit, they represent a real though hidden system of finance because it's Tanaka's 57 bonds scheme all over again. Federal Reserve bonds, self-evidently fake serial numbers. They duplicate, in other words, the very real bonds scandal of the Tanaka government. So, final slide. Hello, there we are. What does all of this possibly indicate? Well, number one, we know that there's a post-war hidden system of finance established by President Truman in 1947 as a state secret utilizing captured and recovered Axis loot. Number two, this hidden system of finance puts the intelligence sector inter into international banking directly. Number three, by the nature of the case, this hidden system requires the collusion of certain prime banks in the scheme and the participation of the former Axis elites to coordinate all of this. Interesting, we left the imperial family in power in Japan. Fourthly, the vast sums of money represented by the bearer bond scandals in the trillions of dollars far exceeds any funding requirements for merely covert operations in the post-war period. Given the nature of that threefold strategic threat confronting the post-war national security establishment, I almost said Nazi, Freudian slip there, folks. And given that the unvouchered funds were used to develop the earliest space technologies in the form of the spy satellite, every indication leads me to conclude that most of this hidden system was probably for the express purpose of funding a long-term secret technological development designed to emulate UFO performance. And you saw that with Michael Schratt and, and Mark McCandlish's uh, presentations this morning. 
Fifthly, by the nature of the case, the vast sums of Axis plunder and the need for extreme secrecy over the long term in the development of these technologies implies that this mechanism constituted a secret reserve by which to defraud the extremely wealthy, and since this reserve was secret, it can be rehypothecated over and over again, creating virtually a limitless leverage and liquidity in the system to fund all of those black projects. Sixthly, by the nature of the case, we are looking, in my opinion, at a part, not all of, but certainly a part of the financing mechanism for a vast and secret space program. Consider, I mean, trillions of dollars just in 2009. Consider that system extrapolated over time from 1947 to now. To ignore the history then of, of the UFO, you're also, if you ignore the UFO, you are unable really to make sense out of the financial system. This mechanism is put into place to deal with it. And therefore, to ignore it, to borrow the phrase and insight of, of Secretary Fitz, this constitutes a gaping material omission, not only in the historiography of the period, but in the understanding of the nature of the current financial system. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.